Rebuilding a Stuart Models Twin Launch Model Steam Engine, this is part 20, making the inlet and exhaust manifolds. There are four manifolds to make, two for the inlet and two for the outlet, to replace these hideous pipes that came with the engine. To make the manifolds, I found a really nice piece of cast gun metal. I bought this stick of cast gun metal many years ago to make some axle boxes for a small locomotive, but I didn't use this piece of gun metal as you can obviously see, because in the end I used a piece of alum bronze, and I really wish I hadn't because it was terrible stuff to machine. I assume that alum bronze is a mixture of aluminium or aluminium and bronze, and it's terrible stuff to machine. I can't ever recommend machining alum bronze, not in the home workshop with blunt cutting tools anyway. On the other hand, this piece of gun metal will machine beautifully. I've chopped off a piece that's long enough to make the four exhaust manifolds, I've scribed a couple of lines on it so I know where I'm going to machine it to, and now it's over to the milling machine. It's firmly clamped in the vise, I know it's resting on a piece of wood, which is not ideal, but it's good enough to keep the piece of gun metal level in the machine vise. This isn't a precision component anyway. Normally for a twin launch engine, Stuart Models supply some castings for these parts, but I need to modify them slightly. When using the castings, the idea is that you drill all the way through on two of them and only part of the way through on the other two. This is the way it's shown on the Stuart drawing for the twin launch. But I want to modify this design slightly. I would like another inlet and another outlet on each side. And that way the engine could be mounted in any kind of an installation without removing the pipes to turn them round. But the main reason for doing it this way is that I need an extra inlet after running a steam engine with cast iron cylinders, as I've mentioned many times before, it is very important to flush away the water with compressed air, after which it's a good idea to pump some oil in to coat the parts to prevent rusting. For instance, on my Stuart Victoria steam plant that I've been featuring recently, there's only one steam inlet, and that's to the top of the governor block, which sits on top of the steam chest. And the problem with this is that after a run, when I want to inject some compressed air and oil into the system, I need to physically remove the steam pipe to do this. What I often do is fit a tap to a spare inlet to the system and then I just connect the pipe to the tap, open the tap and pump the air in first followed by the oil. That can be okay on a larger engine but on an engine of this size I'll probably just fit a removable cap. As you can see the milling operation is well underway and it's looking a bit rough down the middle. That's because I'm taking rough cuts. I'm going far too fast. The final cuts will be much slower and I'll then get a good finish in the vertical plane. When I say I'm going too fast, I don't mean this fast. The video is currently speeded up considerably. Gunmetal machines are a little bit like brass, but it's softer, and the chips that come off gunmetal are not quite as sharp as the chips that come off brass. A word of warning here. Well, not a warning, it's just a caution. Try and avoid touching the chippings that come off pieces of metal that you're using in the milling machine. Cast iron chips are generally not that sharp but steel and brass are to be avoided at all costs, and so is gunmetal. It looks very nice, but it's razor sharp. Brass particularly is very, very nasty. I've stuck these pieces in my fingers so many times over the years, and it's quite painful and very annoying. Here's the piece once I removed it from the milling machine and rounded it off a little bit with the one-inch belt sander. If you have a home workshop and fancy getting into metal work, the first thing you should buy, apart from a lathe, Oh, and a drill, and some hand tools, not forgetting the annual subscription to a therapist, is a one-inch belt sander. Seriously, a one-inch belt sander is the most useful tool in the workshop. I use it for so many things. They really are very, very cheap. There are more expensive ones, and I'd like one of those, but I just use a cheap one. I've recently bought a pair of sanders, a four-inch belt sander and a one-inch belt sander, to replace the two I had, and I bought those in 1988. I need to drill a hole through the middle of each of these parts and the hole needs to be 3 sixteenths of an inch in diameter. And why 3 sixteenths of an inch in diameter? Well the answer is simple. If you use a pipe that is larger than 3 sixteenths of an inch in diameter, by the time I've clad the pipe in string it's going to look too big and clumsy. So here are the four parts with a 3 sixteenths of an inch diameter hole drilled down the centre. These holes are in the correct place relative to the main part of the fitting. So the next job is to go back to the belt sander in order to reprofile the raised part so that the hole is in the centre of the fitting. It will all make sense once everything is mounted on the engine. 
Before I remove the existing inlet manifold and put it in the bin, I'm going to give the engine a bit of a run, just to make sure it's still running OK, and of course it is. It's still a little bit lumpy in the opposite direction. I would think one of the eccentric sheaves still needs minor tweaking, so I'll get my Allen key out and do that. Considering that this engine arrived with me in a box of bits, and I was not sure whether I could actually fix it, at one stage I nearly gave up on it. But anyway, here it is and it's running. These manifolds are still oversized, so I'm measuring the originals. In this clip I'm scribing a line where I need to cut them to size. And I cut them using my small bandsaw. And here they are, cut to the finished size. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I could have used the castings that Stuart Models supply, and it wasn't a cost issue why I didn't buy them, it just seemed pointless, as it only took me about an hour to make them this way. Using the original manifold, I mark the position of the mounting holes, and here, I'm centre drilling them all. I'll speed up the video now. This is a very simple operation, and you can clearly see what I'm doing. First of all, I centre drilled one side, and I turned them round, and centre drilled the other side. And hopefully, once I drill them all the way through, they will fit on the engine perfectly. This cross vice thing I have on my drilling machine is really horrible. It's a terrible piece of equipment. But, I use it for holding parts instead of holding them in my hand. As I've mentioned many times, I'm a keyboard player, so my fingers are quite important, I need all of them. So when I'm drilling things in the drilling machine, the only time I ever hold things in my hand is if the part is large and the drill is small. And that way, should the drill grab, the drill will generally break. Which is not good, but it's much better than the parts spinning round and lacerating your hand. In order to drill these parts in the cross vise, the drill has to go all the way through, and it's actually going into one of the jaws of the cross vise, which are not hardened anyway. And the good thing is that the drill bit is going into an existing hole in the cross vise jaws from some drilling operation from a long time ago. There are quite a few holes in the cross vise jaws, as you can see. This would really bother me if it was a quality piece of equipment, but it's not, it's horrible. And here are the manifolds fitted to the engine, both sides. And you will notice that I've rounded the edges of the manifolds, and I think they look OK. What is important is that they line up. And this clip shows a piece of 3 16 diameter stainless steel pushed through both of the manifolds. I did the same at the other side. And I'm quite pleased to announce that this piece of stainless steel went through both of the manifolds without any pressure whatsoever. All that's left to do is to make the proper piping and fit that and then drill through into the pipe from the underside of the manifolds after the pipe and the manifolds have been silver soldered together. When you next see this engine in the final episode of this series, the manifold piping will be in place along with the lagging and it will be in steam. I intend to give this one a steam test. So that's it for now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Oh, hang on a minute, there's a bonus part here. This sums up what I feel like and look like after a hard day's voiceovering, because I don't use a script. Dad, have you been doing too many voiceovers today? I've been doing lots and lots of voiceovers today. Most of the day, I've been speaking to a computer.